Hey, this is Dr. Rob. I'm coming to you once again from the campus of Arizona Christian University in Phoenix. I'm here for the annual Board of Directors meeting for the Creation Research Society. We are talking about some amazing ideas. We have some amazingly positive things that are happening in society right now, and I can't believe I get to work with this organization and with these amazing men and women who are planning the future of creation research. You can find out more information on creationresearch.org. In fact, speaking of research and ideas, we had an idea about 10 years ago that we needed to have an annual meeting. And this year's annual meeting is going to be at Liberty University. You can look up the details on creationresearch.org. It'll be at the end of July. They're usually in the summertime, so if you're watching this video later, just go to creationresearch.org and look up our uh, upcoming meeting. And you can also attend. In fact, this particular year's meeting, we have a lot of new people. And we're very excited to bring more people into our group and talk about creation and research. And speaking about research, we are talking about this week at this meeting uh, significantly increasing our research budget. Yeah, we give out grants. We've been doing this for decades. Give out money to help support the creation model, help get people to conferences, help um, uh, people buy reagents, help um, uh, push forward uh, different aspects of creation research. In fact, I'm looking forward to the future when we have a whole bunch of students at different Christian colleges around the world, hopefully, who are getting some of our money that will help them do projects that can then be published that will help out um, just the whole big model. Speaking of research, though, a new paper just came out from Johanna or Joanna Kaplanis et al. called Genetic and Chemotherapy Influences on Genome Hypermutation. Now, I just want to take a minute and just highlight some of the really interesting things they found. Now, germline, that means the cells that are passed from one generation to the next. Hypermutation means that they found individuals that had significantly more mutations than average, up to seven times more mutations than average. Now, they were looking at a particular subset of the 100,000 Genomes program. I think they looked at uh, 12,000 families. That's two parents and a child, trios. And if you have two parents and a child, you know if the child has a mutation, which parent it came from. Or if the, the child has a brand new mutation, you know that it's brand new because it wasn't in either of the parents. But they looked at about 12,000 families that had genetic problems, or a, a rare genetic disease, shall we say. And then they looked at another uh, study called the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Study. They looked at another 9,000 families where uh, a child had a developmental problem genetic problem and they sequenced their genomes and they looked at all their DNA and they they identified specific children who had a lot of extra mutations like where these come from well some of the fathers had had chemotherapy in fact um, five of the fathers had had chemo I guess that means cancer before they became a father so the chemotherapeutic chemicals messed up their DNA oh that tells us that environmental influences specifically diet toxins that we eat and we eat toxins all the time if you eat anything that food is loaded with chemicals that would kill you dead if they're at a high concentration but they're a low concentration so they don't kill us but there are other foods that are toxic so toxins in the environment might influence mutation rates there are also two uh, families they found where the father carried a gene for a defective dna repair enzyme and knowing that, they looked at it and said, oh yeah, the child has a lot of extra mutations. Well, a defective DNA repair enzyme, if there's a mutation that occurs in that gene in a small population, it might be that in a short time, a large fraction of the population could carry that gene. And therefore, the population as a whole could mutate faster than other populations. And if that population then intersected with another population, maybe a larger population, that defective DNA repair gene could be lost due to genetic drift. So just because a population or an individual has a lot of mutations now doesn't mean their mutation rate today is high. It means in the past it could have been high. They also found a significant influence of the age of the father, a little bit from the age of the mother, but specifically the age of the father, I think it was 1.28 extra mutations per year. So a six-year-old father, which is the oldest fathers in this study, would have had, compared to a 20-year-old father, 40 extra years, that'd be 40.2, that'd be 40, it'd be nearly 50 extra mutations per generation because of the age of the father. Now, these are not biblical ages. The oldest father is 60. Well, in the Bible, the oldest father that we know of is Noah, and he was over 500 when Shem, Ham, and Japheth were born. 
So there's a 10 times a difference between this study and the biblical model, but it's telling us age of the father is very important, in fact, more important than most everything else. I've talked about something called patriarchal drive several times. I think it's a profoundly important concept for the biblical model. And it's simply that old fathers produce a lot of mutations. They're very old fathers in the Bible, and the population then was small. Very old fathers produce a lot of mutations in a small population. That's a recipe for some individuals carrying a lot more mutations than others. Because the father who might be very old, well, he would have had children when he was also very young. So siblings could be very different from one another depending upon how old dad was when the child was born. This would drive mutations in our population and drive different mutation rates in different branches of the family tree. They showed a chart that looks very similar to my chart. And their chart showed that some individuals are just zingers. They're just way above average. Okay, that's what we predict. Add biblical ages to that and we've got a recipe for a biblical drive, for patriarchal drive. Now, 77% of the mutations came from the father. Very interesting. But after factoring out all the things that they, were, they looked at, they discovered about 20% of those mutations were unexplained. In other words, about one or two out of 10 mutations, they didn't know what caused it. There's not a, a factor there that, would, that they could tease out and say, okay, this is driven by X. Well, that means that there's more research that can be done. That means that maybe some enterprising young creation scientist who wants a little bit of research money to look at such things uh, maybe can score some victories for our side. Just a little hint there that there's possibly research money available, but you have to apply for it. You have to go through creationresearch.org to do that. But there's one final thing I want to say, and that is even though they found individuals with a lot of extra mutations, they did not find a genetic burden associated with those mutations. Even though the, the person had more mutations, they weren't effective. They weren't, you know, mutant noticeably. And that also harkens back to an idea within creationism, pioneered by Dr. John Sanford, uh, called genetic entropy. Yeah, we get a lot of mutations, but most mutations are only a little bit bad. They're bad because you're corrupting a, a, a genome, a, a highly regulated information system. You're, you're mutating it. You're messing up the letters. That's corruption. That is a decay. But they're only slightly bad. Now, the big word is deleterious. Scientists like to use big words. The most mutations, scientists say, are slightly deleterious. For evolution to proceed, natural selection would have to remove almost all of the slightly deleterious mutations or redoom to extinction. And genetic entropy theory, a lot of mathematical modeling, um, a little bit of in vivo studies in the H1N1 influenza genome, we've showed that natural selection cannot remove most mutations. Therefore, almost all species are doomed to extinction. I'm said almost all because that might not apply to something like E. coli, whose mutation rate is less than one per generation. Humans, it's 60 mutations per generation, some people a lot more than that. It's the long-lived multicellular complex organisms that are at the greatest risk from genetic entropy. This paper by Kaplanis et al. Uh, supports this idea. Now, the mutations were rare. Only maybe one out of a thousand, a little less than that, of all the individuals in their study had excess mutations. But it's pointing us in a direction a direction that is aligned with the biblical model. We just have a lot more studying to do. Well, that's it for now. I want to keep it short and sweet. Just want to highlight some of the things we're doing here at the CRS and this new paper because it's very interesting. If you want more info, go to creationresearch.org. Go to my employer's website, creation.com. That's Creation Ministries International. Or go to my website, uh, biblicalgenetics.com. Biblical Genetics is just a little side project that I'm doing. If you'd like to help support my efforts, uh, you can go to biblicalgenetics.com. You can click around on there and you'll find a link for how to support. There's two ways. Uh, the main way mostly is buymeacoffee.com. Just people putting a couple dollars in my hat saying thank you, Carter. Appreciate it a lot. I do have some long-term supporters on um, patreon.com, but they don't get much much um, feedback from me. These are just people who are sitting in the background silently uh, helping me uh, get my videos out when they do come out. There's going to be more coming down the pike in the future. I want to stop here, just encourage you, the Bible can be trusted and that genetics supports the biblical picture. God bless you all.